in a country like ours, the price of freedom is every citizen, you, me, and everybody else, paying close attention, asking intelligent questions. On the whole, Canadians, unlike, for example, Americans and many Europeans, tend to be far too deferential to authority. Right. They look at the figures in authority, they think, well, you know, they're judges or they're cabinet ministers or they're this or they're that or they're something else. I have to pay attention and I have to accept what they say and do what they tell me to do. Mm -hmm. Wrong. You don't have to do those things. At least not without questioning, not without inquiry, not without criticism, not without demanding to be convinced that this is the right course of action. So at the end of the day, it's every citizen's obligation to do these things if we are to preserve uh, freedom and democracy in this country. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Freedom Feature. I'm Barry Bussey. With me today, my special guest is former law professor, a lawyer, uh, who's now retired, Philip Slayton, who uh, lives part of his uh, year down in Nova Scotia and also part up in Ontario. And um, if you don't mind me calling you Professor, Professor Slayton, welcome to our program. I'm very glad to be here. And that's the last time you should call me Professor, please. Okay, very good. <laughs> a long time since I was a professor, and it's not necessarily a title that I cherish anyway. So, Okay, very good. Well, thank you. Um, so I want to uh, just ask you to allow the listeners, the viewers, uh, to know a little bit about your background and um, and your work. Well, uh, I'm a lawyer by trade, as you, as you know, Barry. And that's how I earned my living for most of my life. Uh, I started off as a law clerk at the Supreme Court of Canada. This was back in the day when nobody knew, including the judges, knew what a law clerk was or was supposed to do. <laughs> and then I became a full-time law professor, first at McGill, and then at the University of Western Ontario. Mm. And then I decided it was time to make an honest living. So I took up the practice of law on Bay Street, if you can call that making an honest living. Right. And I did that for a time. And then one day I decided, okay, uh, enough of this. Uh, I don't want to do this anymore. Uh, so I retired and started writing books. And as perhaps you know, I've written an eclectic collection of books, mostly on law or law related themes, but also, for example, one on tennis. Yes, I know. Have much to do with the law. So it's been a sort of a strange, zigzagging career, which on the whole I've enjoyed, but like all careers, it's had its ups and downs. Right, right. Well, the one book that uh, we want to talk about here today in particular is the book Nothing Left to Lose. And that is one that uh, I encourage our listeners to uh, to pick up. And uh, we'll have information below our video here today of this important book. I found it uh, fascinating. And it's, it's one that, um, uh, as I was mentioning to you earlier, this morning, the the idea that as as I read your book, you're neither um, on what uh, uh, commentators. It's kind of a a poor way of trying to describe things, uh, but nevertheless, I guess it's uh, from our from the French Revolution heritage that we got the left and right as the means of understanding political discourse. But I, I see you as neither left nor right, um, but uh, you have uh, what I, I would say that there are there are items here that resonate with with whatever political spectrum. But but you're seeking what seems to me like trying to understand the truth of things and in particular with the issue of freedom. Well, I think I think that's correct. I mean, freedom, as I said to you earlier, uh, before this broadcast began, freedom is a very complicated concept, I think. Mm. Uh, it, it's also a word and a concept that's often uh, appropriated by groups with a particular axe to grind. I mean, the most recent and egregious example of that in this country was the so-called freedom convoy. We all know what that, that is or was, mm -hmm. uh, where the word freedom and the concept of freedom was banded about on the whole by people, I think, who'd never really thought about it and really had no idea what the word or concept was, and to, to the extent they were able to, distorted and mangled the word and concept, and that was in nobody's interest, including their own. So it's a complicated concept. Mm. It has many aspects to it, as I try to describe in the book, and it's not a concept that's easily, getting back to your point, that's easily 
um, adopted by and embraced by either the right or the left. It has some appeal to both the right and the left. Mm -hmm. So the right has an obvious attraction to ideas of, for example, less government intervention. They tend to associate freedom with that. Right. Oversimplification, but there is some of that. The left, on the other hand, uh, will tell you that some of the essential aspects of freedom, for example, reducing inequality of income, requires more government and more government intervention. So there's a yeah. tension between these two. It's a very fundamental tension, I think, with the concept of freedom, and one that it's very hard to resolve. I make some comments about that in the book, but it's very hard to resolve that fundamental tension associated with the concept of freedom. The, the, the beauty about uh, interviewing you now, uh, some... Uh, it's only two years, but it seems like it's been a long two years since the book was published, um, is that we now are able to get your further thinking and analysis of what's gone on since. You start off with a very important question. Is Canada free? And uh, you, uh, in the book, it seems to me that like it's free to a degree, but not a whole lot. Can you kind of expand on that for us? I mean, Canada, obviously, in many respects, is a free country. If most of us citizens of Canada were asked, is Canada free? We look at the person asking the question and say, well, what kind of question is that? Obviously, it is free, certainly relative to most other places. Mm -hmm. Again, as I say, freedom is a very complicated concept. And both in some details and also in some big pictures, big picture, I don't think it is. So I'll give you a couple of examples. And these are perhaps examples drawn from my own personal, to some degree, from my own personal background and history. I think the system of education in this country, and particularly post-secondary education, has deteriorated dramatically, and we are no longer producing adult citizens in great numbers who are able to, dis who, who understand government, who understand society, and are able to ask discerning questions and make discerning criticisms about it. And I regard that ability as essential to the functioning of a free and democratic country. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of my favorite anecdotes, I mentioned this in the book, I think, is when uh, somebody once said to me, the, the, the purpose of a good university education is to teach you to know, and it's the only thing that really matters, is to teach you to know a good argument from a bad argument. Right. But what could be more fundamental than that? And right. I think this ability uh, on the part of Canadian citizens and Canadian society to know a good argument from a bad argument has dramatically deteriorated. And that, in my opinion, has an effect on our ability to nurture and promote and live in a free society. One other example. Uh, but yes, there was a time until, what, 15 or 20 years ago, when the traditional fourth estate, the traditional press, the traditional newspaper mm. was vital to the functioning of our society, our government, our community, because it was the press who, by and large, independently and objectively, I don't want to romanticize this too much, but by and large, right. independently and objectively, tried to find out what was happening and where they thought it was necessary to be critical of what was happening, to criticize it. Mm -hmm. Well, the traditional press including the tr traditional radio and television, has essentially collapsed when it comes to that function, has been replaced by a chaotic social media free-for-all mm -hmm. where standards are, are essentially non-existent. So what is the citizen supposed to do when it comes to finding out what is happening and forming opinions about what is happening? Mm -hmm. So there's just two ways in which I think, not just in Canada, but generally, but in Canada, our ability to nurture and protect and understand even what freedom is mm -hmm. radically deteriorated. Let's just uh, go back and unpack a little bit about the university. I myself am a graduate of uh, Western Law School. Uh, what, what, what years were you there? I was there, uh, Barry, from 1977 to 1983. You, okay. you, you I think, what came somewhat, somewhat after that. Yes, yes. So I, I came in 1989. In, you know, I, I didn't realize it at the time, but uh, while uh, looking back on it, I, I look at some of the professors there. Uh, I'm not sure if they would even be allowed to teach there anymore uh, if it were today. You know, yeah. guys like Ian Hunter, who was very critical of the charter, for example. And uh, when we look at universities um, and let's just uh, talk a little bit about law 
law schools right now because you have experience in it. I've spent uh, enough time in law school. And uh, there's there's this sense that um, one recent uh, graduate from the University of Ottawa that I was talking to, I, I was up at uh, one of my favorite haunts in Ottawa is Benjamin uh, Books uh, Store. It's a kind of a academic uh, bookstore. And it's uh, while I was there uh, waiting for the store to open, I was speaking to this law student from the University of Ottawa, and she was from Toronto. And I said, so how's your, your year going? She says, I hate it. I said, well, you hate it? I said, why? Uh, she said, it's the most woke place that I've ever been. She says, I'm sick and tired about all the social justice talk in every single class. It never stops. And, um, and I, you know, and I've had other law students talk to me on those kinds of things. Um, and it seems like law now is a, is a means to not necessarily, um, learning the nuts and bolts of, you know, our legal traditions and and understanding the the nuts and bolts of law but now it's like okay there's a purpose and the purpose is to uh, change the system to just go out and basically be critical and i.e that is to say um you know knock it down so there are some uh, students who've shared with me this this idea that i uh, while there may have been a little bit of that even back in the 90s not a whole lot really i i really felt i got a fairly classical understanding of the law. But today, some students are sharing that, you know what, life is uh, very different in the law school. My experience with law schools is very much out of date now. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the last time I taught at a law school was probably at the University of Cape Town in South Africa in the early 2000s. Okay. So it's ancient history, so far as my personal experience is concerned. That was all before the kind of phenomenon that you're describing happened. Yeah. In fact, in those days, if there was a criticism you would make of law schools, it would be, in a sense, the reverse of what you just described. It would be mm. all they want to do is, in a rather unimaginative way, teach you the nuts and bolts so you can get out there and practice law and make a living. And they're not interested enough in the history of law, legal philosophy, uh, the relationship of law and other disciplines and so on. They're just not interested enough in it. That was the criticism in those days. Right. That's a criticism I often made myself, somewhat to my personal cost, I might say. But mm. I think that's all been overtaken now by what you describe. And my perception from talking to people and reading is that law schools, and not, not just law schools, of course, right. all universities, all post-secondary education, has been infected by this uh, woke political virus. And to me, that goes back to the point I made earlier on, which is <clears throat> that it's not the place of these institutions to promote any particular uh, political cause, uh, political attitude, or whatever. It's the place of the institution to teach you how to analyze for yourself what you think is right and why you think it's right. Mm -hmm. And also, by the way, I've always said that when you're met with a bad argument, or when you're met with an outrageous statement or criticism, the right response is not to sh shut that person up, right. not to, quote, de-platform them, right. not, to, not, to, not to take away their right to speak. Yes. The right response to that is to say, listen, maybe this is naive, I don't know, but nonetheless, mm -hmm. listen, I don't agree with you. And here's why I don't agree with you. Here are my mm -hmm. reasons for not agreeing with you. What do you have to say to that? Mm -hmm. And then you have, hopefully some kind of informed debate, some kind of dialogue out of which some understanding or even the truth will emerge. That seems to be, from what I can tell, to be sorely lacking in today's educational universe, and not just the educational universe, the universe in general. We are all consumed by fear that if we don't sign up for the appropriate attitude, whatever it may be at the moment, we're going to get into trouble. Our jobs will be threatened. Our livelihood will be threatened. We'll be trolled on social media or whatever. Right. That's a very inhibiting effect. I mean, very. I mean, I'm just. I've just finished writing a book for my God help me on anti-Semitism and identity politics. This is a very hot issue. Right. Uh, this book will come out next year. There are some things in this book I think that are going to make me very unpopular. Mm. I'm used to that. But the point is. You don't, when you want to say something or write something, say, well, I better not do that. 
because mm. if I do, I'm going to get trolled. I'm going to get criticized. You know, I'm, people are going to throw eggs at me on the street. You just do it. Let the chips fall where they may. And if people disagree with you, you ask them why, and you have a debate. But all of that seems to me, to be on the whole, there may be exceptions to this, but on the whole, to be sorely lacking in today's world. And the Canada is part of today's world, and it's sorely lacking in our country. How do we combat this in the universities? Like, uh, I mean, I, I I look at Peter, some pronounce him Berger or some Berger, uh, but the sociologists, American sociologists, talked about secularism, you know, and how, um, you know, the secularist theory was that as people get more educated, religion will fade away into the distance and all of that kind of stuff. And then later on in his career, he says, well, no, that's not quite how things are turning out as we expected. Uh, but there are several entities that have really adopted the secularism motif, and that is the academic uh, world, the academy, uh, journalism, and the legal profession. There's this th- this idea that we have we have now arrived at our current uh, time, and there's nothing we need to learn from the past, and only that's uh, all that's in the past is you know racist. It's um, all of the isms that we don't like. And um, but now we're now at a, a higher level and we're going to change things. But how do we how do we deal with this? Is this something where we just let it uh, unfold? And um, if it occurs the way I think it's going to occur, it's simply going to collapse in on itself. And then we try to pick up the pieces later. What do we do? Uh, well, that's the big question, isn't it? What do we do? Yeah. I don't know. But, but just picking up on one thing you just suggested, I think the idea that we reject history, mm-hmm. uh, that we reject literature that written in a different era where different attitudes prevailed, where we kind of reject the whole of our past human experience because it was bad, it was inappropriate, it doesn't pass muster by today's standards. To me, mm-hmm. that is absurd, first of all, and dangerous. I mean, it's our history. I don't just mean the history of political events. I mean, th- including history of literature, the history of political and philosophical thought, and so on. It's our history that brought us to where we are now. Right. And there may be things in that history that, on reflection, applying today's standards, uh, we regret. I, I think often, by the way, we regret things, or pe- people say they regret things, and often they, they don't just say it, they tear down statues. They change the names of universities. They do all sorts of things without, dare I say it, really having subjected to careful thought, analysis, scrutiny, and understanding what it is they're doing and what it is they're reacting to. There's a lot of knee-jerk stuff going on here. But anyway, you can't reject our history. It's what got us to the point we're at now. You can Mm -hmm. certainly try and understand it. You can see where it might be inappropriate by today's standards. And that's an important qualification by today's standards because standards change. Yeah. You know, what's acceptable now or not acceptable now, they would be, have been very acceptable 100 years ago. Right. And it's legitimate to go back in time a century and criticize people and events by today's standards or not. It's a big question. Mm. Hard to answer that question. I think what we do now is redouble our efforts to properly understand and evaluate what got us to where we are now what's wrong with where we are now, and there are undoubtedly things wrong with it. Mm -hmm. But what's right with where we are now as well? We Mm -hmm. can't just throw everything overboard. We we can't just throw everything overboard as if it didn't matter, because it does matter. Looking at the fact that we have a, you know, I kind of parrot, I suppose, a little bit of Jordan Peterson when he says, you know, look around you, you know, you got the lights on. Well, uh, did the light just happen to come by happenstance no you got the guys who are out there working on the pole lines you've got the infrastructure you've got the technology and all the rest of it and we can now enjoy the lights well think about what you and i are doing right now we're having a conversation miles apart that will be put up uh eventually on our website that the entire world can watch i mean this is an amazing era in which to live and we don't have to worry about having a a roof over our heads, having food in our pantry. Uh, There is an awful lot that we can say, hey, you know what? There's something about living in this time that's actually quite wonderful, but we didn't get here by happenstance. And it's that, I guess, lack of appreciation uh, that we're 
we're, we're seeing. No, I agree. I agree entirely with that. I mean, I sometimes reflect when I arrive back from somewhere at Pearson Airport in Toronto. You know, the mm-hmm. plane comes in, you look out of the window, you see this very large city, large complex infrastructure, beautiful big buildings, garbage trucks. You can't see that from the plane, but picking up <laughs> garbage. People are going about their affairs, all the things you described, f- f- groceries in the grocery store, lights come on at the flick of a switch. That didn't come from nowhere. Yeah, That came from the efforts and thought and imagination of a lot of people over a long period of time. Mm. It's a legacy, really, to those of us who are living today. Right. Um, and it's a legacy that should be recognized, and it's a legacy that should be respected, and it's a legacy that should not be easily, certainly in whole, or even in part, rejected. Mm. You know, so, for example, this, this is a comment that may get me into trouble. Well, I'll make it anyway. So, for example, I sometimes say to myself, I, and by the way, I'm a big promoter of a very liberal immigration program and refugee program for Canada. Mm-hmm. But I just say this. You know, if you're coming to Canada from Afghanistan or Ukraine or Syria or Yemen or wherever it is, and Canada's welcoming you to come participate in the society, when your plan- plane lands at Pearson Airport, getting back to the plane landing at Pearson Airport, you're entering a whole society built by other people, mm-hmm. at often great cost to themselves, that you can now enjoy the benefit of. Right. And so with that comes a certain set of obligations on your part as well, you know, to be a good citizen, to obey the law, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's, not, it's a complicated issue. It's a two-way street. But again, it depends upon, getting back to an earlier part of our discussion, it depends upon a recognition and an understanding of the history and every, all the effort that got us to where we are today. So there's also that obligation uh, to understand uh, the country you're coming into. Um, I have uh, a, a number of friends uh, from uh, Sri Lanka who are right into hockey. I mean, hockey is uh, kind of like my sport, as it were. Some of these guys who've come in, they've adopted Canada. Here it is. You've got now first-generation Canadians who are taking up our sports, all the rest of it. And it's just like, yes, I mean, this is awesome to be able to have that uh, that cultural mix and uh, and and to be able to be engaged and that's so key and so important. I I, I look now as well at the universities with respect to um, uh, the concept of uh, tenure and uh, for the university professors. More and more, we're starting to see questions being raised about tenure. Um, you know, because uh, they have the wrong attitude or the wrong principle or the wrong research or whatever. And it just uh, strikes me that uh, this this is another taking away of uh, what we've understood in the past as uh, kind of like a rite of passage. Well, I think, Barry, you and I are going to part company on this one. Okay, good. I have been a criticism of the concept of tenure for a long time. Okay. Um, and I've spoken out against it and written against it, not in recent years, but in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, and my objection to it principally was, as far as I could see, it served no purpose uh, that couldn't be served otherwise. And it offered a, a, um, a shield, a defense to people who often were habitually underperforming or not performing at all. Mm. A, a, a defense he should not have. Now, the, re, the response to that always from died in the wool academics. And by the way, I was a full professor with tenure myself, even when I spoke this way. So I was, to some extent, speaking out, out against self interest. But the response always is oh, tenure is essential to academic freedom, which is, I think, where, where you were coming from. That you have to give these people the ability to say whatever they want without fear of losing their jobs. Mm-hmm. And that was accomplished by means of tenure. Mm-hmm. Now, it won't surprise you to know, Barry, that I firmly and vigorously believe that people should have the ability to say whatever they want, with very few exceptions. There are some mm-hmm. exceptions, but very few. Right. And that, of course, includes university professors more than most other occupations, because it's mm-hmm. their job, in theory at least, to pursue and expound the truth. Right. But you can protect academic freedom without giving people a lifetime contract 
and complete and utter job security in the face of all reality. You can right. do it other ways. And that's what I thought should happen. But this is a bug bit, not a bug bit. This is a an absolute uh, a, a token or a, a something that professors with tenure fully and utterly and completely believe. And they go, they react very adversely to any criticism of the concept. Now, one other comment I'd make to you, and that is this, that one of the effects of a tenure system in universities, particularly when universities suffer from financial hardships as they do these days for various reasons, mm-hmm. the universities will divert their teaching staff to non-tenure tracks, sessional lecturers, adjunct professors, creating a whole academic subclass of people mm-hmm. who have no job security, uh, who are badly paid, and often perform poorly, as you would expect, in those kinds of circumstances. So for these and other reasons, I'm not a great fan of tenure, but I am a great fan of encouraging people, no matter who they are, where they are, to speak out freely with very few constraints, like, because that's an essential part, getting back to our original discussion, mm-hmm. an essential part of a free society. And I think right. that's very few constraints. And I think that's a uh, uh, very good point. Uh, one of the things that I was uh, thinking of here as well is the uh, movement afoot uh, in the United States uh, to take away tenure. So it's uh, great to hear your your uh, your thought on this concept. And the reality that in the academy, um, People are commenting more and more that we're only getting one uh, particular political view in the university. So in other words, there's uh, very little room for those who have a conservative uh, take on things. So uh, various, um, uh, I've seen various studies uh, mentioned that like it's something like 6% uh, will be uh, of a conservative bent versus a more uh, liberal, i.e., left bent. Do, do you have any comment about somewhat of the homogenization process that's going on uh, in the in the thinking of universities? Well, I, I mean, I don't know whether that is the case. It wouldn't surprise me if it were the case, but I don't know it to be the case. Yeah, um, I think to the extent that there is homogenization, as you put it, of political thinking or of attitudes within the university, it's a very bad thing because clearly. There are many different points of view. There are many different ways you can think about things. Mm. And I would have thought it was axiomatic that if a university should be a place where there's a clash of these ideas, mm. if nowhere else. And if there is not a clash of those ideas, then it's unfortunate. Now, you mentioned earlier in our conversation about the woke thing happening in law schools and beyond law schools and universities in general. Yeah. And I believe from what I hear and what I read that to be true. And I believe that a consequence of that is heavy pressure put upon those who don't agree with those particular attitudes, which may lead them either to be very uncomfortable and controversial, or more likely may lead them to just shut up, to you know, to, to protect their well-being and sanity. Right. That's very unfortunate because, again, I come back to my original point, or one of my original points, which is the universes are places where there needs to be a clash of ideas. We need people need to be taught to know what are good ideas, good arguments, and bad ideas and bad arguments. And that only comes out of kind of a maelstrom of thinking, discussion, argument, and a clash of opposing views. And if that doesn't happen, then what is happening? No, great point. Great point. Okay, so I want to move on now to the next point you you had already uh, broached, and that is the issue of journalism. And the one uh, question I have there is, what is your thought with respect to the prime minister uh, paying for um, the <laughs> the the news organizations, they're getting like six or seven hundred million dollars a year subsidy. Plus, uh, of course, uh, the flagship CBC gets one point one or one point two billion. What does that do for our freedom? I think that's a bit of a loaded question, Barry. <laughs> uh, well, look, I mean, without getting into the the weeds on this, really, right? Okay. Clearly, on principle, it's a bad thing if a government has some control over the media, no matter what kind of control that is and how much they've got. That's a bad thing. With a capital B and a capital T, a bad thing. If you accept my premise, which is it's the essential function of media 
to monitor what government does, mm-hmm. to report on what government does, and to criticize what government does when it feels it to be appropriate. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, to me, an essential part of what media does. And I regret deeply, as again, we discussed this a little bit before, that on the whole, this is not happening much for various reasons. It's not happening much now at all. It's been mm-hmm. replaced by, you know, Elon Musk's uh, Twitter and the kind of the chaotic free for all on Twitter and other social media platforms. That's bad. It's not mm-hmm. properly curated. It's not properly disciplined. Anybody can say anything. However, let me just put a footnote on that. To some extent, anybody being able to say anything is a good thing. That's a paradox. Yeah, that's right. A platform yeah. to people who wouldn't have otherwise had it. Yeah. But anyway, putting that aside. So anyway, to answer your question, to the extent our prime minister or any prime minister or any government in any country seeks to control the media, that's a very bad thing and it needs to be resisted at all costs. Right. And now I know, uh, for example, uh, the prime minister has – or at least it appears uh, from what we hear from some reports from independent media, independent media being like Rebel News, True North, and so forth, um, are being unable to access, uh, for example, leaders' debates and that kind of thing. So the argument is being made by independent media, look, well, the reason why the others are allowed in is because the government, uh, they're, they're basically government lackeys. Now, Paul Wells, (laughs) <laughs> who just recently left McLean's uh, to go independent, said, look, I disagree with the argument that we are government lackeys. This is not his words, this is my words, uh, government lackeys, or that we, uh, he says, I feel like uh, I did good work when I was with McLean's, but I will admit that when people say, well, yeah, but you're subsidized by government, and he said, well, I really didn't have a, a comeback argument on that. Uh, because of the way it looks, right? So it's the, uh, in in law, we talk about justice must not only be done, but seem to be done. And and uh, so there's that, the sense of illegitimacy that goes on in journalist circles uh, when people criticize them because they're receiving government money. I, I certainly hear that and I understand that. And I would reiterate my general point, which is any kind of influence government exerts of a media directly or indirectly, mm-hmm. financially or otherwise, has to be a bad thing. However, yeah. that said, again, I regret to say this, but it's true, it's complicated. Right. Because there are important parts of our cultural infrastructure, including newspapers, but not just newspapers, which cannot really be, in any meaningful sense, financially self-supporting. Right. Because the community as a whole won't do it. They won't buy traditional newspapers from a newsstand. They won't buy enough books to support people who write them. I speak from the heart when I tell you that. (laughs) Um, There is a big financial hole that has to be filled somehow. Now, the question is, can the government fill that hole, preserve and promote our culture without overstepping the boundaries that we've just been discussing? Now, I'll give you an example. I mean, it, I'm a member of the Writers' Union of Canada. Mm-hmm. And the Writers' Union of Canada, representing writers, obviously, periodically does a survey of the incomes of people who write books. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, when it comes to writing books, there are good books, there are bad books, and there's a vast number of indifferent books in the middle, and I've made my contribution to that. <laughs> uh, um but, I, I would think that you'd be on the good books myself. But, well, uh, <laughs> the Writers' Union of Canada last survey, if I remember correctly, uh, reported that the average income in Canada of writers, annual income, was about $9,000. Mm. And by the way, if you re- remove people like Margaret Atwood from the count, that 9000 would drop down to about 500 <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Anyway, that's so clearly you cannot make a living writing with a very few exceptions, even good good books, even important books. So what's going to happen? Well, one of the things that's happened is the Canada Council, through some of its programs, tries to help writers supplementing their income. In a very modest way, I might say, but nonetheless, it does do that. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's a thing called the public lending right, which tracks how many times your books are taken out of the library, which, of course, you get no direct revenue from when that happens. And we'll give you some money based upon that. It's a modest amount, but it's something. And many writers 
even though it's a modest amount, really to some degree depend upon that. That's a Canada Council funded program that's been around for a long time, is of great value, and I don't think any writer has ever experienced any attempt to control what they write as a result of these fairly modest amounts they receive from the Canada Council. That's a good thing, I think. Right. And that program should be expanded, and I believe there are plans to expand it. That's a good thing. But there are many aspects of trying to control the written word that clearly would be a bad thing. And it's a dangerous, it's dangerous territory. But as I repeat my main point here, which is, who's going to pay for this? Mm-hmm. Who's going to pay for free, free expression like everything else has a price tag attached to it. And if you try to make a living writing editorials, writing op-ed pieces, writing books, you're going to have a really tough uphill sledge unless some of you get some kind of help. Where's that help going to come from? Who's going to pay for it? And what strings, if any, are attached? I want to move on to another uh, area of concern, and that is, um, you. in fact, you've written a book, uh, Mighty Judgment, and I encourage uh, our listeners and viewers to pick up a copy, Mighty Judgment, and, and you also make mention of it here in uh, the book, um, uh, Nothing Left to Lose. Uh, but the uh, concept of the courts today, um, we have uh, our current... Um, uh, Chief Justice uh, in his uh, first and I think only press conference. I don't think he's done another press conference that I'm aware of. Uh, but in 2018, he gave a press conference and talked about the whole idea that, you know what, we don't read the Constitution as it was written. We read it into context of the modern age and uh, we get to decide, you know, basically what it means today. Uh, what's your your sense of uh, the state of freedom uh, being advocated by the court? Well, Barry, I'm very conflicted on this. I've changed over the years. I've changed my mind more than once on this mm. issue. Uh, when the Charter of Rights and Freedoms came out in 1982, uh, along with Ian Hunter, you mentioned earlier, I think mm. um, I felt this was a bad thing. Because I was a dyed-in-the-wool historical traditionalist and a believer in parliamentary sovereignty. Mm -hmm. I looked at the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and I said, this is going to give the judiciary vast political powers, which they shouldn't have, Mm -hmm. because they're appointed, not elected. Uh, They're all cut both literally and figuratively to some extent from the same cloth. It's the same kind of people. Right. And in a democracy, in a free democracy, these people should not be deciding fundamental questions. Uh, As time went by, uh, I changed my mind on this. Because I began to see the merit of having a kind of an offsetting power to the legislative and executive branch. And by by the way, in this connection, this is very germane to the whole concept of freedom. In this Mm -hmm. connection, I would emphasize to you what you already know, which is the extreme power in our system of the executive branch, which means the prime minister. And I want to get to that one next. <laughs> I mean, the prime minister has, in our country, and just generally in parliamentary systems, but let's just focus on our yeah. country, has a ex- huge amount of power. Yeah. And that suggests that you need some kind of countervailing force. And I could see that the value of the Supreme Court, and it's shown this over time, Mm-hmm. value of the Supreme Court of Canada in being such a countervailing force. That, however, does not remove the fact that the Supreme Court of Canada, nine unelected lawyers, uh, has the power, to great power, to affect change in this country through interpretation of laws, reinterpretation of laws. It's a very powerful body. And it has, again, some knock-on effects, which I've mentioned from time to time. So, for example, politicians love to use this concept of uh, the judiciary deciding matters under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. If a concept is really tricky, politically tricky, politically controversial, like, for example, uh, assisted death, Mm -hmm. abortion, gay rights, you know, political minefields often, it's very easy for politicians to say, well, that's a matter for the courts to decide according to the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. I'm not going to do that. Right. right. And that leads me back to the fundamental point, which is in a system like ours, you know, we try to out to the polls, we vote for people to represent us. It's been developed and refined over quite a long period of time. In a system like ours, 
is this appropriate? So I'm conflicted. I started off by saying no. I moved tentatively to saying yes. But tomorrow I might wake up and think no again. I can't tell you. Okay. One of the uh, things that has caused me some concern in recent years is the concept of charter values. And um, what I have observed is that in a number of cases, the Supreme Court uses this concept in administrative law areas. And for those who are listening, administrative law are those areas where you'll have bureaucrats uh, often who are making decisions on behalf of government. Uh, but, uh, you know, we will have various agencies that are are dealing with licensing requirements or other decisions that are being made. And the courts have basically said that if uh, the decision maker, the government actor, makes a decision but takes within that process of decision making, looks to the charter and considers the charter values that are being applied in this matter, uh, that as long as they do that, we, the court, will not, we, we will defer to that decision maker. And, and the problem I have with it, and I just want to see what your thoughts are, but my, my problem is, number one, is that it, uh, it, the concept charter values is not even in the Constitution. It's not part of the charter. And then what is it? And if we look at, um, you know, uh, the critics on the court, uh, particularly um, uh, uh, Justice Brown has said that it, and Cote have, said, have called it the idiosyncrasies of the judicial mind. <laughs> it comes from that. Uh, uh, but it's the, you know, it's like we'll know what it is when we see it, but we can't really put our fingers on it. It's almost kind of like it's the spirit of the charter and, and that kind of thing. And then, and then you can have uh, litigants who have actual charter rights that are being denied. Uh, because of the way in which they exercise those rights that are against the charter values and 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 that kind of concept. So that's that's been a, a real problem. the The other thing is is that I've noticed that um, in a number of these various uh, decisions is that the courts seem to be deferring quite a bit right now to the executive. And I think of, uh, for example, the carbon tax decision. Uh, there's other decisions that are made. What are your thoughts when you when you see the courts basically uh, deferring more and more to that executive power that you point out that is actually quite powerful in this country? Well, it's a difficult question to answer. I have no simple answer to it. I mean, I think mm -hmm. on the one hand, you could say it's appropriate for the courts to defer to the legitimate, what appears to be the legitimate exercise of executive power. I mean, the, the executive, the governor of Canada derives its power, in theory at least, from the from elected parliament and the governor of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, and to the extent power is delegated to them and they exercise it legitimately, what is the role of the courts to interfere there? So you could say on the one hand, that's fine. But on the other hand, harkening back to an earlier part of our discussion, uh, it is the job, the way, the way things are constituted now, it is the job of the courts to push back against the executive power when it seems to be appropriate. Now, how do you decide if you push back because it's appropriate to do so, or you don't push back because you're faced with a legitimate exercise of executive power? Well, this brings up your phrase, chart of that, or not your phrase, the phrase, chart of values. Mm -hmm. now, how does the charter indicate we should proceed on this matter? The trouble, of course, with charter values is what is what are charter values? They're whatever you say they are, right? Yeah. Exactly. If you're a judge. Now, the, the idea that somehow judges don't have personal views on these matters uh, is ridiculous. Right. Everybody knows they do. I mean, mm -hmm. they're like, Everybody else, you know, the, the creatures of their lives, their experience, their education, their background, they have views. In the United States, if you look at the Supreme Court, this has been manifest for a long time. In some right. cases, very dramatically. Look at late Justice Scalia, for example. Boy, mm -hmm. did he ever have views. And he wasn't <laughs> afraid of expressing them, not just in judgments, but on late night TV talk shows. Right. All judges have views. Now, in Canada, it's more subdued. It's less overt. Partly that's because I think, and I talk about this in my book, Mighty Judgment, partly because the Canadian public has really, really given a pass to the judiciary in the Supreme Court. 
it has not subjected it to the kind of intense scrutiny that's taken place in the United States, where people really pay attention. Canada, still, I think, people don't pay attention. So the, the judges get a pass on this. So they're able to express their personal views and decide accordingly. Now, that's inevitable, Barry. You're mm-hmm. not going to be able to remove that. Mm-hmm. The idea, for example, when judges are, uh, are nominated for appointment and they're quizzed about their personal views and say, I have no personal views. You know, the chief justice, current chief justice of the United States f- uh, famously said when he was being considered, I'm just the empire, umpire. I just call balls and strikes, right? Well, yeah. <laughs> Robert, we, we know that's not true. <laughs> that's also the case in Canada. But where does that take you? I don't know where that takes you in terms of a criticism or a conclusion or a judgment on how the system operates. It's just the way it is. We're all fallible human beings and operate accordingly. Okay, so my next question is going to be a segue into the uh, position of the prime minister, uh, because the prime minister, his office, appoints all of the superior court judges across the country, which is a huge amount of judges and a huge amount of influence on the law. What about the idea, uh, and and I I have some, um, I guess, uh, growing concern with respect to the uh, power of the prime minister. Um, and primarily it comes uh, most recently as a result of the, the issue or with invoking the Emergencies Act back in February, February 14, a great Valentine's gift uh, to the to the country. So what I'm wondering if if we've not come to a place where uh, so much power is given to the hands of the prime minister that we shouldn't have some kind of a mechanism that takes the appointment of the judges away from the, or at least creates a bit more separation from the office of prime minister. Um, Yes. Yes. I agree with that. I think we should. And I've written about that from time to time. I mean, as things stand now, as you know, uh, the appointment of a judge of any superior court, any federal court, but primarily of interest to the Supreme Court of Canada, mm-hmm. is within the gift of the prime minister. Now, he doesn't mess about appointing you know, federal trial judges in the province of Alberta. That's all done through the Minister of Justice's office. Right. But he certainly pays close attention, I think, to appellate courts, and certainly to the Supreme Court of Canada. And it's essentially within his gift. Now, there are committees that advise. Uh, there is a mechanism fairly recently put into place whereby a, a nominee appears before Parliament to answer questions. But that's all window dressing. Right. It's the Prime Minister who chooses the judges. Uh, and I think that's a bad thing. I mean, I have suggested from time to time that Canada adopt a system somewhat like that in the United States, where, as you know, the, the President of the United States nominates a judge and that judge is then has to be confirmed by the Senate of the, mm-hmm. of the United States. Uh, and that's a real confirmation. And sometimes judges withdraw for various reasons. And sometimes they're not confirmed by the Senate. It's a real mm-hmm. power. Uh, the appointment to the Supreme Court of the United States is not solely within the power of the President of the United States. And I think that's a good thing. Now, when I've said this in the past, people say, oh, no, that's a terrible idea. Because look what happens. You right. get judges appearing before the Senate and they get cross questioned about, you know, whether did they go to beer drinking parties when they were at university and did they do this? And and it's a horrible show and the judges all misrepresent their position. It's intensely political. We don't want anything to do with that. Well, I understand all of that. And Mm -hmm. look at the recent history of judicial nominations in the United States. There's a lot of criticism you can make of them, of the process. Mm -hmm. But on balance, I prefer that to, you know, covert decisions being made in the corridors of power, and all we get to know about is is the end result without without any say in it. Of course, it deprives the press of the opportunity to say, well, who is this person? Let's dig around. Let's find out what we can about this person. What have they said? What are they... What are previous decisions? What are their attitudes? What have they have they lived a blameless life, and mm-hmm. all of that? So it's I, I don't like the system we now have. The country was not in a dire strait of collapse or anything that would even fit the definition in the Emergencies Act. We also had a situation where uh, the powers that that existed prior to the invocation of the act did, through court order and so forth, get the truckers out of the various uh, uh, border dispute blockades and so forth. And it seemed to me that the very same thing could have been done 
and getting an injunction to get them removed out of Ottawa without having to go through the Emergencies Act. And yet the prime minister thought it necessary. Now, I know there's the appointment of this inquiry, uh, but but it strikes me that there's still way too much power vested in the prime minister for him to have done what he what he did. I agree with you. I think it was a very ill-advised thing to have done. And as far as I can tell, and I only know what I know from reading the newspapers and watching television, right. what I can tell it was totally unnecessary. Uh, what I saw there was really a question of police ineptitude, not some kind of problem with the legal structure or applicable laws that could only be fixed by invoking the Emergency Powers Act. So I think it was completely unnecessary. I can't imagine why it was done unless it was a piece of piece of political theater that the prime minister thought would satisfy people who were complaining a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, so I agree with you. Uh, and I'm not even clear what powers were used under that act or what actually was done pursuant to that act that couldn't have been done otherwise. So it was although that, free freezing of their bank accounts was uh <laughs> Yeah, I don't even understand much about that. I'm not sure whose bank accounts were frozen, how that happened. I suspect not much happened, in fact. But that's just speculation on my part. A bad idea, but as you suggest, um, an illustration of the great residual power that the prime minister has. Now, he he, he can do that. His father did it before him. That was a different set of circumstances. Um, Great power. Uh, badly utilized. Uh, but th- but that's just one example of the great power in general the prime minister has. And I would make one observation there, and that is you may recall that at one time the prime minister campaigned on introducing a system of proportional representation. Yes. Um, the idea being that there were many small parties, the Green Party, for example, who were essentially shut out of the commons although they received a not insignificant percentage of votes, I'm not sure in the case of the Green Party, maybe 6 or 7%, let's say, something like that, mm-hmm. but received nothing like that representation in the House of Commons. And this was a bad idea for freedom and democracy, so the Prime Minister said. And he promised he would change it. He right. did not do that. I think because one morning he woke up and said, wait a minute, this system works to my advantage. I don't think I want to change this system after all. And then, of course, you dress that up by saying, oh, well, Proportional representation is a bad idea because you'll never have a stable majority government. Look at look at Italy, look at Israel. You know where they change governments the way we change socks. Um, that's a bad yeah. idea. So let's not do that. Yeah. Well, is it a bad idea or is it not? I don't know. I mean, there are a lot of people in this country who don't want to vote for the two major parties and essentially are shut out of the process because of that. Yeah. So it's it seems to me if there's a, a, another public inquiry needed, it's one on uh, looking at the possibility of taming down the office of prime minister. I I I'm, I, I feel like uh, that it doesn't matter who's in, right? So when Harper was in, the the other side were very angry and upset with this, you know, with this kingly power. And then now that uh, you got uh, their own guy in with. Uh, well, no, no, we we want to like, keep things as is. So it's like, you know, we I, I do think, though, that as Canadians, we need to be thinking about this a lot more and we need to have that check and balance. Like, I'm very thankful that the framers of that Emergencies Act did require the Senate to have a, a say in this uh, whole process and it was, I think, because of uh, the sense that the Senate may voted against him that he ultimately withdrew. But it, but and and what's interesting in that is is that in some ways, by him freeing up the Liberal caucus in the Senate, actually probably led to a sense of greater independence developing within the Senate, which is, I think, it's ironic, but also very important. Barry, I know we're getting to the end of our time, but there's yes. one last comment I want to make, but kind of yes. a general comment that to some yes, please. I think kind of unites a number of these disparate things we've been talking about. And I write about this in the book, and that is the whole question of deference. Mm. Deference that the average Canadian citizen, not just the average Canadian citizen, tends to have towards powerful institutions, towards, for example, the Supreme Court of Canada, as we were discussing. You know, somebody said that the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, in a country like ours, the price of freedom is every citizen 
you, me, and everybody else, paying close attention, mm -hmm. not accepting as given or as necessary or as inevitable what happens, ask, asking intelligent questions, asking to be convinced if they think an argument is not a good argument, getting back to that trope that I, we discussed earlier on. Yep. It's a question of not being deferential. And I think on the whole, Canadians, unlike, for example, Americans and many Europeans, tend to be far too deferential to authority. Right. They look at the figures in authority and they think, well, you know, they're judges or they're cabinet ministers or they're this or they're that or they're something else. I have to pay attention and I have to accept what they say and do what they tell me to do. Mm -hmm. Wrong. You don't have to do those things, at least not without questioning, not without inquiry, not without criticism, not without demanding to be convinced that this is the right course of action. So at the end of the day, it's every citizen's obligation to do these things if we are to preserve uh, freedom and democracy in this country. Well, you know what? I think that's a wonderful place uh, to end. I think that's extremely important for us um, uh, to to really take seriously. And I, I want to thank you so much, Philip, for being willing to take the time as talk about your books, talk about your ideas. It's just absolutely wonderful to have met you, though virtually. And I look forward someday uh, when we have a chance to visit Nova Scotia, maybe seeing your your beautiful gardens. I, I was impressed with the gardens you got on your, on your website there. Wonderful. It's a little hobby of mine. Wonderful. So thank you again. And uh, I want to thank you for uh, listening and watching our programs. Uh, we encourage you to go over to firstfreedoms.ca and to uh, sign up for our newsletter. Also, if you wouldn't mind just clicking that like button underneath, that would be really helpful for us. And uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity here now to be able to share about the importance of freedom. And it's so important as um, uh, Philip Slayton just said, the importance of us not to constantly give deference to those in authority. We need to be thinking about these issues ourselves and get engaged so that we all can be free. Until next time, I'm Barry Bussey. The fight for freedom consists not only in the legal battles in court, but also in the battle of ideas at the universities and in the media. It takes time, effort, and money to keep on top of the debates for freedom. Your donation allows us to keep fighting for all Canadians. Firstfreedoms.ca